Hello everyone, welcome back to History Savvy. In today's episode, we're going to be continuing on with Extra History's series on Frederick the Great. This is episode four called The Seven Years War. So without further ado, let's just get right into the video. Berlin, December 28th, 1746. The newspapers, the banners, and the choirs of children all have a new name Lots for their children. monarch, Frederick the Great. And the reasons are obvious to everyone who greets him as he returns victorious from the Second Silesian War. Not only had the Prussian army won every battle, Frederick had personally led his forces. At the Battle of Soar, Charles of Lorraine had ambushed Frederick's camp, the Austrians outnumbering his army nearly two to one, but Frederick fought his way free. Then when Prussia was under its greatest threat, when Austria and Saxony planned a two-pronged invasion to take Berlin, Frederick and his general had defeated both forces, taking Saxony's great city of Dresden and negotiating an end to the war. That's why the newspapers call him the Great. That and the fact that he'd probably written ahead to inform them all of his new title. But if you've been watching the So, just uh, two things I guess I want to comment on on this point at this juncture is uh, so Frederick's War ends in 1746. The War of Austrian Succession carries on for another two more years for the Austrians. So they get two more years to update, modernize uh, their armies in a general preparation for a later attack on Silesia and a retaking of Silesia from Prussia. Also, Frederick is only 33 years old at this point when he's being called the Great after this, the Second Silesian War. And I think that's important to know because uh, a lot of times I think folks tend to look at Frederick as an old man. You know, they, they if you Google Frederick the Great, a lot of the paintings you'll see first off are him and his old age, you know, his 50s through his 70s. And that's not fully representative of who he was. So here, when he became the Great, he was a young man at 33 years of age the show for any extended period of time, you're probably going to be familiar with the next precedent. A great monarch cannot know peace for long. Especially one so as ambitious as him. Do you want to see the next episode of this series immediately after watching this one instead of having to wait a full week? Well, now with the new Nebula first, you totally can. Learn how after the episode. Victory in the First and Second Silesian Wars secured Prussia's reputation as a rising power and Frederick as a man to be reckoned with. It also bought him a decade of peace and splendor that could be attributed to not only his battlefield skill, but also two of his tenants when it came to warfare. The first was that Frederick believed over all else in the power of military speed. He who got his army out and able to act first won, and the best way to lose a conflict was to draw it out. He knew the Prussian army couldn't remain effective indefinitely, so his wars needed a quick conclusion. And the second reason was that while Frederick was good at war, he didn't like it. Even his mentor, Eugene of Savoy, had commented on this when Frederick was a young officer, and he meant it as a compliment. Frederick wasn't bloodthirsty. Frankly, he... Right, and that is a direct quote from Eugene of Savoy, and that's, as it briefly mentioned, that's going back to when Frederick was still crown prince in Prussia, not uh, king in Prussia or pr king of Prussia. He'd rather be at the new summer home he'd built in Potsdam, which he'd given the French name of Sans Souci, or without worries. There, in an environment of his own design, he was free to write poetry, play the flute, display his porcelain collection, dote over his beloved greyhounds, and gather about him an inner circle of philosophers and military officers, all of them male, as women were banned. Oh, yeah, just a quick... Yes, uh, that was a, a fair list of all the things that he did at Sans Souci, but uh, he did quite a bit more. In fact, Frederick the Great and Voltaire had a falling out after some years, and Voltaire went back to France and wrote a sort of expose on Frederick the Great that became very, very popular. And that expose did certainly include some of Frederick's sexual activities, with men as Sans Souci. Uh, so I, I guess I should say we we believe that work, that book comes from Voltaire. It's in his style. There's no definitive proof that it's his. But uh, the style is pretty indicative, and I think most historians would agree it's probably from Voltaire. Quick FYI here, Frederick was also a huge misogynist. 
which at least partway explains his antagonism towards both Maria Theresa and Empress Elizabeth of Russia. Which is something I think I mentioned in previous episodes. Also, if a guy in his inner circle ever got married, he often kicked them out. Said sir. In a way, uh, there's a phrase that pops to mind. If you were a servant in uh, Sans Souci, you could be offering, you could go up to Frederick the Great and offer coffee, tea, or me sort of thing. So, yeah, it was a pretty libertine environment at Sans Souci. The circle he developed included some of the most prominent minds in Europe including his old editor Voltaire, who yep. came to live in Prussia after stirring the pot a little too much in France. He also provided safe harbor to Julien Offray de la Métrie, a scandalous philosopher whose work argued that humans were just organic machines, no better than animals, and that the mind and soul were part of the body rather than a spiritual entity. In fact, he literally argued that humans were nothing more than a digestive system. Hot stuff at the time, especially since he denied the existence of God and advocated oh. the pursuit of pleasure. And you bet these ideas jived with Frederick. Who that, uh, I, I'm glad they included that, because I think in a way, he's sort of a intellectual forefather or ancestor to some modern atheist philosophies. Uh, rather than just being a digestive system, we are, some philosophies say that we are a, a uh, collection of cells and firing neurons without any real free agency. It's a really interesting philosophical discuss discussion to be had, and I'm glad they bring it up just to show that what we might consider to be new and edgy sometimes really is just um, warmed over philosophical thought. Who was privately an outspoken atheist. In fact, he found pretending to be religious one of the hardest parts of the masquerade he'd had to perform for his father. He once wrote that Christianity was a fiction, invented in the fevered minds of Asia, with its followers in Europe either being fanatics, imbeciles, or those pretending belief in order to gain power. He also jokingly suggested Jesus and the Apostle John were gay lovers. So suffice to say, at the time, Frederick was unconventional in his <laughs> views. But that also to led to tolerant religious policies that saw all Protestant groups given equality and Catholics allowed to practice, though not allowed in civil service. Right. So I think that that Frederick's tolerance of Christian religion um, is an example of real politic or just uh, practical politics, because though Prussia was Protestant, there were parts of newly conquered territory that were either Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. And if you don't give a rat's butt about religion anyway, then why not allow it kind of thing. But he wasn't uh, cool with all religions, uh, certainly not Jews, who were uh, I, uh, more prominent in the eastern parts of, of his kingdom at the time. However, he was also extremely anti-Semitic. Jews could live in Prussia, but had to pay a tax for security. Which, honestly, is just like Frederick. Seriously, for everything you learn about him that you like, he'll tend to have an equally awful quality. And that's definitely a pattern that's going to come up again and again. So watch out for that. This take a... <laughs> Right, which I think is just one way of saying that Frederick was human. And, you know, history is human, and humans are flawed. So I think the best thing we can do in our modern times um, is look at historical figures and be inspired by the good that they did and by their good attributes and learn from the mistakes they made and not repeat their bad attributes or, you know, cultivate that in our own personal lives or our own cultures. It also provided his first really prolific period of writing. Partly, these histories were meant to burnish his reputation and iron out less complimentary episodes in his career. He exaggerated enemy numbers at Malwitz, for instance, claiming that the Austrians had a much larger force than they did, and casting his flight from the battlefield as a reluctant but daring escape. In addition, <laughs> he wrote his... History is written by the victors, and... Frederick is taken that to a very personal level. First book on military theory, primarily to distribute to his generals. He also drilled his troops. And I wonder if that uh, book would have been sort of like a secret, like a classified document type thing. Because if, you know, your enemies get a hold of that, then they're going to know all of your tactics. And, it, you know, it's just you've just made each and every battle you fight then on even harder because they can anticipate your moves. So... I, I don't really know, but I do wonder if that book would have been considered classified material at the time. And, you know, that opens up 
Uh, lots of questions about espionage. What did Austrian and French espionage look like at the court of Frederick the Great here, and vice versa? And if any of those spies ever uh, got their hands on on Frederick's uh, war book or book of tactics. In interesting thought. Because Frederick wanted to be ready for the next war, he innovated, adopting a new system of formation marching that ensured troops could quickly reposition, change direction, and adopt new formations on the battlefield. He figured out ways to go over broken ground or ditches while maintaining order, and adopted snare drums as a way of conveying orders, since they were easier to hear amidst battle than a human voice. He also promoted his younger brothers. Wait, do we not mention he had brothers? Well, he did, and they served as officers in the Silesian Wars, but now were made generals. Of the two, his youngest brother, Prince Henry, would become the most dependable. Henry had many things in common with Frederick, like his head for tactics and a tendency towards affairs with fellow officers. And I think, I think it's Henry, if I'm not mistaken, and I might be, but I think it's Henry who absolutely refused to marry at all, thus making Frederick the better option in the mind of their father as the future of Prussia, because Frederick was at least willing to marry Elizabeth Christine. But he was also notably more measured, and Frederick would need dependable generals, because by 1756, Europe was about to see its First World War. Now, it would be far too much to describe in this series how the Seven Years' War started, since the motivations are enormously complicated. Like the War of Austrian Succession, it was an umbrella conflict that encompassed a lot of little wars. But in Central Europe, it was all about Silesia again. And coming from an American perspective, I think we in America and the United States tend to focus on, well, obviously, the French and Indian War, uh, the North American sort of theater of that war, but also the French and the British aspect of this war. We focus on French and British history, especially British history, because, you know, in a way there are cultural um, ancestors. Uh, but Central Europe is no less interesting, and you have each nation trying to create a balance of power in Europe that gives itself the best shot at a profitable and secure future. So the shifts in balance of power in Europe take a kind of an abrupt turn uh, just before the Seven Years' War, which helped lead into the Seven Years' War itself. Um, let's see if they mention it. See, when Frederick took Silesia, the Protestant state of Brandenburg, Prussia, essentially announced itself as a challenger to Catholic Austria, which had held sway over the Holy Roman Empire for centuries. Worse, it gave Prussia a border right on Bohemia, meaning Prussia could invade Austrian lands at will. Austria needed Silesia back, and Prussia crushed. So, through a series of both public and secret diplomatic agreements, Maria Theresa had entered defensive alliances with both Russia and Saxony to support each other in case of Prussian aggression, then decimate Brandenburg Prussia and partition it amongst themselves. And Saxony certainly had a good reason to ally itself with with Austria, given Frederick's, you know, relatively recent um, successful invasion and seizure of Dresden, which, you know, is, is down in this area here. So Saxony definitely wanted to have a bigger, better, better power uh, on its side to protect it from Brand Brandenburg. But also over here, Hanover, the British monarch, King George II's German possessions, he was worried that France would uh, seize Hanover in the next conflict. So that helped push him into an alliance with Prussia. Frederick, for his part, had his eye on Saxony and Polish West Prussia, the conquest of which could link up his broken territories. But for all of his supposed genius, he badly bungled his diplomacy. What protected him from the Austro-Russian alliance was the support of France. But he also pursued and signed an alliance with its rival, Britain promising not to attack the British royal family's German possessions of Hanover in exchange for Britain funding Frederick in case of war. Also, again, it was a defensive thing, too, that Prussia would help defend Hanover in the event of a French attack there. But that agreement blew up the balance of diplomacy in Europe, so much so that it's now known as the Diplomatic Revolution of 1756. France became furious with Frederick for allying with its enemy Britain, leaving France isolated without any allies in Europe. And this wasn't the first time he'd screwed them over diplomatically either. 
There had been that secret truce with Austria during the First Silesian War, then making a separate peace with Austria <laughs> and dropping out of the Second Silesian War. So, yeah, you could... Right, so that's, again, that's why I said it. He, he ended his war with Austria two years before the larger war ended. And I love the little Homer Simpson, Homer Simpson Bush's reference there. That's great. Hardly blame France when they dropped Frederick as an ally and aligned with Austria. And the Russians, furious with the British having simultaneously negotiated a peace with them and their enemy Prussia, also pledged troops to Austria. This was a massive realignment of powers, and everyone started preparing for war. So imagine being in Frederick's position at this point. He has, he's duffed it, in a sense, and now he is literally surrounded by enemies powerful enemies who can launch an attack at any moment so he's got to figure out a way to fight his way out of this predicament and uh i guess i'll just let it roll but point is he in this moment is feeling extremely claustrophobic and threatened by france austria and russia who are allied against him frederick seeing this true to form decided to strike first and on August 26th, 1756, he led his troops into Saxony. But this would not be Silesia all over again. Frederick blundered his way into an ambush in the fog, his troops raked by fire of hidden artillery and infantry. In a confused engagement, his cavalry charged twice without orders, and he accidentally fired on his own troops. While able to later spin it as a victory, the Austrians left the battlefield since they only wanted to halt Frederick. It was in reality a narrow defeat. These are not the same Austrians, his officers muttered. Turns out, the enemy had been training too. Though he managed... Well, and they had that two extra years of warfare to, uh, to refine themselves with. You know, it's one thing to practice the theory, and it's another thing to engage in the actual practice of the thing. ...to capture Saxony, as was his plan, and impress their military into his own, but he did have to wait until winter ended to attack Prague, hoping to capture it and then march on Vienna. But then the Austrians met him at Prague. He attacked their positions across what appeared to be grassy hills, but that were, in reality, fish ponds. They took the heights, but at a cost. In five hours, Frederick lost 14,000 men and two of his best generals, including the one that had saved him at Mulwitz. Depleted, he decided to take Prague by starving them out in a siege rather than by assault. But that was when the Austrian relief army of 54,000 came for him. And he was made to split his forces, leaving a detachment at the siege and facing the oncoming army with only 34,000 men. Soon, it would be Prussia against the world. And actually... So, yeah, that was, I guess, uh, let's see if this is commercial. That could be sooner than you think, because you can watch our fifth... Yep, it's a commercial. So, <clears throat> I would like to know what maps Frederick was working with when he uh, went for Prague. If you've ever been to Prague, um, the the really old part of the city is is up on a hill over the river. It's an absolutely gorgeous city, and uh, I've been a resident of Vienna, and I would say Prague is prettier than Vienna. I'm sorry, Vienna. I still love you. But um, so Prague would have been a really difficult city to take, and as a military commander, you need accurate maps to be effective on the battlefield. So whatever mechanism for intelligence he was using at the time really screwed him over there. And I don't know enough about Frederick. I know, you know, the larger movements and sort of the geopolitical shifts at the time, more from the Austrian side than I do the Prussian side. But still, at the end of the day, if you're going to make an assault or have a battle over a piece of ground, you definitely want to know what that ground is like so you can um, avoid obstacles and take advantages where you can. Um, this was especially important. Well, it's always been important, but um, you know, especially important in in later battlefields. So I guess that concludes this particular episode. And I'd like to thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.